guide into discoveries, coming to you live from the heart of America to around the globe via the World Wide Web, satellite, and podcast. Let's journey together into the realms of the known to the unknown in search of enlightenment, knowledge, and truth. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are on this beautiful planet Earth. Today we have a really fascinating guest with us today. His name is William Von Holtz. He's the editor and spokesperson for Imri Valian, author of the book, The Way of the Spiritual Warrior, The Timeless Path to Enlightenment. On the spiritual warrior path, you do not quit the world. You meet the world head on. And in that meeting, moment by moment, there is enlightenment. The art of the warrior is to be enlightened every second of every day. It is not something you look forward to in the future. It is something you live now. The warrior path is always the, in the immediate moment at the second of time in our total relationship with the outer world and the world inside of you with the divine presence within you and the divine presence outside you. It is the conjunction between God within, the God without, and the cosmos in between. That is the path, that is the way of the spiritual warrior, the spiritual path for today. I am really excited to have um, William here today as the spokesperson and again as the editor of the way of the spiritual warrior. I want to let everyone know um, that if you have questions for our guests today, please do be sure to use the feature of the chat room there and place all of your questions in all caps so that my uh, engineer, Brian, uh, can forward those questions on and we can get them asked today on the air. So if you hear something that you would like to ask a question about, please definitely make sure that you put all your questions in caps. We're looking forward to this interview today, or this actually just a conversation uh, with William. Uh, he just he, we told we talked a few minutes before we went on the air, and he had just gotten back from a retreat with Emery. Uh, he spent three weeks over in Germany, um, and there's a lot of information to share here. He's going to share with us uh, uh, information on Emery himself, uh, his role in all of this. Uh, as well as getting into the actual content of the book. Welcome to the show, William. It's really wonderful to have you here today. Thank you. So let's start with um, how did you originally get involved with Emery's work? I think that might uh, probably help. I figured you'd be the best person to kind of give us some information on this man uh, and his life's work. Um, as opposed to me just sitting up here talking because you're the one that knows him personally and certainly obviously work with him very closely as well as um, probably involve yourself in uh, this particular way of life. It was 30 years ago this summer and I had a teacher up in Canada and she had called me up and said you must come to Salmon Arm, which is in British Columbia, and meet this man, and Valian, of course. And she said that he works with the hierarchy, the spiritual hierarchy. And I knew this woman well enough to know that if she says that he indeed works with the true spiritual hierarchy, then that was, that was an absolute truth. So uh, I... Uh, okay, hang it, on right there for just a second. I'm going to bring you back to that term spiritual hierarchy here in just a few minutes um, but please continue your story I just wanted to kind of make a note of that um, that I will be asking you about that so go ahead so that was 30 years ago 30 years ago and uh, I had many teachers prior to that and some were famous and what I always discovered in in this I was 34 at the time that I would have these teachers and I would learn certain things, but there came uh, a moment where I had reached the end of their knowledge field and right. I almost gave up on the spiritual path. And then when I met Emery, I knew very, very quickly that there was no end to his knowledge field. I have been with them for 30 years. I feel I'm just 
scratching the surface of what this man knows, what this man comprehends, what this man lives in his consciousness. So it's been a long journey, and uh, it's not over. And that's, uh, that's a brief introduction to, to, to my um, first moment with Emery Valion 30 years ago. Well, I think you've made a, a couple of wonderful, really good points there, was that um, some of the teachers do reach a plateau. Um, that's a, not a negative nor a positive. It just is what it is. Um, so let's get into the terminology that you use. It's called spiritual hierarchy. Um, and then we'll have you get into a little bit more about Emory, because I'm sure that kind of involves all of that. So speak to, me, speak to us on spiritual hierarchy. Well, what the spiritual hierarchy is not is that it's, it's, not, uh, it's not beings that channel through mediums and say they're the master kutumi or the, you know, th there's a lot of misconceptions about the spiritual hierarchy. The true spiritual hierarchy is a realm of beings who live on the invisible realms, way, way past the, the levels of our souls. And these are the beings who have, in previous incarnations, become enlightened. So they essentially become our teachers, or they become our the governing body that is continually overlooking what happens here on this on this planet. So they are, in essence, our our bosses. They are the ones that that monitor what what the human what the human race is doing. They make decisions periodically to to send one of their own down into physical incarnation for a particular reason. Throughout the ages, they have sent people like the Christ or the Buddha or Kuan Yin or various other teachers. And these teachers have come down into the planet, a particular culture, a particular time to give a new impulse. So, of course, Christ gave the impulse of love. The Buddha gave the impulse of wisdom. Kuan Yin gave the impulse of compassion. So Emery is is part of that process. He is he has been sent down to, to give to the West this uh, understanding of uni unification of both the Eastern techniques and Western techniques. So there's not a division between, because it always has been in the past, the East has been very, very different in their spiritual approaches to the West. And what his mission has been is to really uh, blend together to really marry that those traditions of the East with the traditions of the West so that it becomes a one unified spiritual path. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about Emory himself. Um, as far as his as far as he is concerned and and whatever he shared with you, I'm assuming by just the statements that you're making is, is that when he was born into this world and into the physical reality here, um, that, that he, had he always known that he was on this path or did he have some event or something that guided him? Can you give us a little information as to how Imre became this wonderful teacher that he is. He, um, he, he doesn't speak about this very often, but occasionally he will speak about his experiences when he was three years old. And he, uh, he was lying in bed and he was taken into this huge, mysterious, he refers to as divine darkness. And of course, as a three-year-old, he was quite terrified of it and immediately came back into his body. And then being the little adventurous soul that he is, he decided at you know, lying in his bed at three, well, maybe it's not quite so bad. Maybe I'll go check it out again. So what, what he did was that, and this is uh, the best way to understand what Emery knows, is that he, he, he understands things from the experience themselves, meaning he doesn't channel, he doesn't do research and, and analyze what other people have, have talked about, what he does is that he goes into the inner realms and there are, part of this is what his teaching is, that there's many, many realms beyond the realm of being a human being or there's many realms within a human being that we're not conscious of. 
So we are here on the physical plane, we have physical bodies, we have physical experiences. The next level is that there's an emotional body, an astral body, a feminine body, and that's our subconscious energy field. And we all have, we, we experience that when we dream, we experience that, most of us experience that when we die. And then there's also, it's referred to as the mental plane. The mental plane is full of thoughts, uh, ideas, uh, the intelligence, and that's another world, very, very different than this physical plane, very different than this emotional plane. And then above that, or at the heights of, of that dimension, that world is the world of our soul. And so each of us, of course, is a soul. We have incarnated many, many times. And that soul is immortal. That soul is on a journey. And part of that soul's journey is that it has to incarnate into a physical body to further its journey. But then above the level of the soul, there's other very mysterious dimensions, very mysterious worlds. Uh, these are the worlds that great teachers come from. Above the world of the soul is the world of the buddhic dimension, and above the uh, buddhic is nirvanic dimension. So these are very powerful, different worlds, and each of us has, has these within us. It's just that we are so full of worldly vibrations are so full of our personality vibrations that we're not aware of these these inner worlds. So what Emory teaches is there's there's no denying, there's no repression of anything here on the physical plane or the emotional plane or the mental plane, but what it is is a way of balancing these three lower bodies and in that balancing then you are able to perceive as he did as a very small child at three, he perceived that divine darkness. And so when you perceive these inner worlds within yourself, you understand them. You, you know, because of your consciousness is so aware of this dimension, you understand that dimension, and then you're able to, to bring that down here in the physical plane and help others. So, um, we've, we've all heard the... Uh, terminology of nirvana. Uh, well, most I, I'm assuming most everybody out there has heard the term term uh, nirvana. Um, I've never actually quite heard it put the hierarchy put together in in that way that there's the Buddhist and uh, Buddhic and then the uh, nirvana uh, levels, uh, the hierarchical levels. Uh, I think that's a really, really interesting concept. Uh, um, it, it really is quite delightful. Um, because when you, you know, they've talked about when you reach the state of nirvana. Uh, fascinating. I think that's just fascinating. That's lovely. All right, so back to the, to the book. Let's get to the book for a minute if we can. Um, the Way of the Spiritual Warrior. Um, it's a, 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 a book, it's an instructional book, basically, but it doesn't read like an instructional book. Do um, you have any comments about that or, or, or anything that you'd like to express as far as the overall statement there? Question. Well, what these, Emery's books are very kind of mysterious in the way that they come about because what they are is that they are really um, various talks from various different retreats that Emory is instructing 200 people and what he does is that he tunes into the people in front of him and knows essentially where their consciousness is or where their questions are or where they're stumbling on the spiritual path and then he he speaks to to help them move on to the next level so this way of the spiritual warrior is a, a book that is very practical. It helps the, the person in the everyday life, people with emotional problems, people with diseases, people who, who stumble on the spiritual path. But what it does is it gives them hope or it gives them a clear understanding of what the true path is. And part of Emery's mission, besides this, this marriage of the East and the West, is that when people receive true knowledge, meaning when people hear truth, the truth itself can help liberate. 
meaning that if you really understand clearly how the universe is made up, if you understand clearly how you as a human being are made up, if you understand who you truly are, not just the physical body and the emotional body and the mental body, but you understand that there's also a soul, you are the soul, as Emery says, you don't have a soul, you are the soul. So what he does is he's continually helping us to, to in a way, remove the layers that surround each of us. These layers are, are substances. These layers is a, an energy of, of, of confusion or energy of worldly vibrations. When those layers that surround us become clear or balanced, then we automatically, our perceptions are open and we perceive our soul or our soul perceives us. Or we're able to, to go to the next level, we're able to experience the buddhic plane or, as you said earlier, the, there's this nirvanic plane. The nirvanic plane is this brilliant world of light, like a, a, a piercing light itself. And that's, that's all part of who each of us is. So what Emory is doing is the unlocking the mysteries of the everyday person. You know, um, wow, that just brings a whole lot of things into into question here for me, and I'm not sure where to go with it, so let me think about that. But I, I, I shared with everybody that you just came off of a three-week retreat with Emory. I'd like for you to, to talk about that, but before you talk about that, I'd like for you maybe to share your own story. I mean, you shared a little bit, but what I'd like for you to get into is how did you get to be the editor and the spokesperson for Emory in regards to this particular book? Well, that's a, a whole long process. And 2009, we were giving a book talk throughout California, and uh, there was a person supposed to be coming down from Canada, and for whatever reason, he wasn't able to make it. So I kind of got thrown onto the job of, of speaking about Emory and his books. And it... Um, it came very naturally, it, uh, and also because I, I know Emery, I know him personally, I, he's lived with me in Chicago, San Diego, San Francisco, so I also know him as a human being, besides that of a, of a teacher. So it, it, and I've worked, as I said in the beginning, I've, I've worked with him for 30 years, so I've been on many, many retreats with him. I, I you know, not to be arrogant or anything, but I do understand what what he's what he's teaching i do understand this process i have experienced this process so i can really speak from from not just a, a, a intellectual conceptual level but i've experienced it and to give you an example we were there were 200 of us in a retreat in germany and three weeks the first two weeks was very dynamic we did meditations we did chanting we did warrior work which is a kind of like a tai chi where you work with your body and you become tuned in to, to how your energy field works. So for the first two weeks, it was very dynamic and active. And then what he does on the third week is that the third week is total in, totally in silence, meaning that you, you really go within. You're not, of course, speaking with other people. But what's even more important is that you are in the process of quieting your thoughts and quieting the, the activity around you. And when, when you are able to do that, and of course it's a luxury to, to be on a retreat and, and not have to pay attention to all the, the worldly things that all of us get so you know, tied up with, is that when you, when you are really quiet within, when there's really a true silence, then your, your soul itself or the universe itself can work upon you. So what Emory teaches is that part of what we do is a purification process, meaning that you, for anyone who meditates, for anyone who does any kind of spiritual activity, for anyone who even walks on a beach quietly or looks at a sunset and is just in awe of that sunset, that's all part of your spiritual training. That's all part of your spiritual purification because you're opening yourself up to something other, something more mysterious. So we, we go through that process, that, that purification, and then there's a certain point when, when your energy field or your aura or your, 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 your lower bodies are 
balanced or harmonized, then the the universe itself can work upon you, and and your soul is is technically part of that that mysterious universe that then begins to work upon you and begins to to transform you so that and this is the whole point of the book you become a spiritual warrior meaning that you're able to stand on the earth stand on the physical plane you embody light and in that embodiment of light you are able to help others you're able to to give out a vibration to give out a frequency to give out a quality that soothes all the chaos of this world or helps soothe the chaos of the world helps you know there's a moment of, of tranquility that surrounds you that helps others so let me uh, let me interject here just for a few moments um, uh, one of the things that I had to learn to do was to learn to quiet my thoughts um, Early on, I, I, my thoughts were very chaotic. It kept me in, in a fast-paced motion. I was always moving, doing something, because I had all this chatter going on in my head all the time. So it was, a, it was pretty chaotic when I look back at it. And um, I learned how to stop the chatter. And one of the tools that I used was learning meditation was the breathing in and the breathing out. Uh, that was the first portion is learning how to breathe and focus on the breathing and just releasing and r not letting the thoughts, the, the, the chatter, the whatever is going on in the mind it, to interrupt, um, but just to be in the moment, whatever that moment is. And honestly, for anybody out here that's listening and you need some guide to this 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 book it will help you it will tremendously help you if nothing else it'll give you the strength and um it, it feels like you have a support mechanism there at all times but that has probably been the most beneficial thing to me ever william in my life personally was to learn how to seize the moment so to speak to be in the moment and i cannot tell you how many times i have been moved almost to tears and I know it sounds hokey, but it's it's absolute truth. I'm speaking from my heart. Where I have observed a sunset or the la waves uh, gently lapping up on a, on a beach um, or watching a flower um, sway gently in the breeze because I was just being in that moment and just feeling that moment and just allowing that moment to be. No no thoughts, no judgments, no concerns, no opinions, but to be in the moment and it, it it's absolutely the most rejuvenating it's beyond really words <laughs> my opinion of course. And um I, I highly recommend for anybody out here that's watching this now or will be watching this later is to listen to what William is saying because that's those simple things it, it's, it's, it's not simple but it is simple it's because we've been trained otherwise and that's my opinion we've been trained otherwise it's to ignore those things but you know William all these things that you've said is just absolutely beautiful because when you exude that, that peaceful harmonic energy and you bring at least um, the energy that's flowing from you is non-chaotic it can affect this world in a very, very positive way. We, we're, many are not aware of how our energy field, as, a, as we interact during the day with other people, how it affects them. And it's, it's that unseen world that most people aren't really familiar with. And you're absolutely right. That, and also that unseen world really impacts us as well. So just going to a grocery store or getting caught in traffic or all the things that we get so, you know, we can't, I mean, that's part of what Emery is teaching is that we don't run off to monasteries or run off to the to this desert and pray. What a spiritual warrior is, is someone that is fully in the world. And being in that world moment by moment, there is that, that, that point where you're able to hold the light. 
Or another way of looking at it is that what you're really doing, when, as you mentioned so beautifully, when, you're, when you learn to quiet your thoughts, what you really are doing, you are on that search for the Holy Grail. Meaning that within you is the Holy Grail itself. Or is that, that divine connection that, that embodies all of us. So when you begin to quiet your thoughts, when you begin to quiet your, your energy fields, then you are truly, you know, there's many um, traditions and, and myths about searching for the Holy Grail. The Holy Grail is within you, and that, that quieting of yourself is part of it. In the first few chapters, Emery gives a really nice metaphor about four tires and a vehicle. And I think it also really helps people understand who they are. Because once you understand who you are, then you can really, really get serious about searching for that Holy Grail. What he says is that we essentially have four tires, and those four tires, the first tire is the physical body, the physicalness of the world. The second tire is your etheric body, or the vitality. An athlete has a very strong etheric body, a very strong vital body. There's another tire, which is your emotional body, your feeling subconscious body, and there's another tire that is your mental body. But what most of us do is that we drive around thinking we are the driver and we're driving on one or two or maybe three tires, but not all four tires. So someone could be very, very physical, very practical, very in the world, very productive, but also very, very mental. So they're essentially only driving on two, two of their tires and the other two, the emotional subconscious feminine, they're not aware of, or they're that vital body they may not be aware of. So what Emory teaches is that when you balance those four tires, when the vehicle becomes solid on the pavement, so all four tires are on the pavement, then what happens is you discover that the true driver of that vehicle is your soul, your soul itself. And the soul is always wanting to be the driver, but when you are sort of driving on a single tire with your mental body, you're not allowing the soul to be the driver. So what Emory teaches is to balance, to always be in balance, to balance the feminine masculine within you, to balance the, the dynamic and, and the passive. And in that balancing, then the soul, who's really in search of that holy grail, can take the wheels and, and drive the way, drive towards that holy grail, or help you as a personality, and this is a beautiful term that, that I love that I'm re refers to, is that you become a soul-infused personality, meaning that you're still here, and this is the West. In the East, what people do, they meditated and they went up to their souls, they, they hung out in the, in the immortal soul level, but they were completely useless here in the physical plane. So in the West, what he teaches is that you become a soul infused personality, meaning you, you pay taxes, you are a father, you're a mother, you have children, you go to work, you do all these things, you're of benefit to, to a family, to a community, to a nation, but you're also embodying that enlightenment, or you're also embodying the energy of your soul itself. You know, that is absolutely beautiful. Um, so you brought up chapters in the book. Let's, let's, let's dig down into this a little bit. Um, let, let's first of all. I, I kind of want to separate this out a little bit um, for the audience, if I may, William. If somebody was to pick up this book, The Way of the Spiritual Warrior, would you recommend out of Emery's works that this be the first one they start with, or what is? And this is the second part of that. What is some of the other books as more of an introduction, maybe to for people? Um, or is that such the case? Uh, I myself absolutely loved this book, by the way. I, I just, I, it was, it's just perfect, in my opinion. But is there, uh, is there other books that Emory has written that may be better suited for somebody maybe just entering into the way of the warrior? The, the two recent books that Emory has published, the first one is The Journey Within, and that is a really a, a excellent book for someone beginning this this journey or, or beginning to to question who they are. the The way of the spiritual warrior is 
in essence, it's, it's for people who really already are on the path and have questions or have had struggles or need a little guidance. So both books are, are very good, but I definitely would recommend The Journey Within to start off with. Okay, so we do know that these books are available from Amazon.com, yes? And they're also, we have our own publishing company called Sounding Light. Okay, so it's let me write www. That. Go ahead. Sound, Sounding Light. And the, Emery always loves to, to talk about this, where, he's, where he says, where there's sound, there's light, <laughs> and when there's light, there's sound. And so what he, what he teaches, he's really, and this is part of why he is such a teacher as he is, is because he has had many prior Eastern incarnations. So he was trained in the East. He was trained as a mantric yogi, meaning he was trained in the power of sound itself. So what he's done is that he has come to the West to give these beautiful, powerful techniques of working with sound that he that he learned many incarnations prior by other teachers in the East. So what, what he's saying is that where there's sound, there's light, and when there's light, there's sound. And for us, it is as a human being, we're able to make sound. It's a gift to, to have a throat chakra to actually make sound is quite a gift. And that gift we can use it to create, we can also use it to destroy. So it's a very powerful gift. But what he's saying is that since we have this gift to make sound, we can make sound, we can make sacred sounds, we can intone sacred words, we can intone sacred mantras, and when we do that, light is present. And what he says is that it's harder for us to sit down and create light. That's, that's a little bit more challenging but the beauty of this sounding light is that when we do create sounds, and especially when a group is together and they're doing chanting or they're doing um, a particular mantra or they're intoning, uh, for, for Emery, he, in, he intones uh, sacred vowels. And there's, there's an enormous focus in a single vowel. That What that does is that it brings the light itself into your being, and that light itself through that sound helps you discover the Holy Grail within, or helps you discover the mysteries of you, who you truly are. But what I find so beautiful about Emery is that for him, the human being is this absolutely magnificent being, magnificent creature, magnificent creation. And the tragedy is that so many of us are only using just a very small fraction of who we truly are. And when more and more people begin to really discover the mysteries within, then what that's doing is that it's changing the vibration of the planet itself, and it's helping, of course, we're going through a crisis period, there are many conflicts in this planet, there's many violence, there's many disagreements, there's many, there's much anger on this planet, there's much sorrow, there's much suffering, but when more and more people can embody in their own being a, a lighter vibration or a vibration of love or a vibration of, of compassion or a vibration of wisdom that helps soothe the, the, the whole vibration of the whole planet itself and helps our, our little Mother Earth through her crisis. Well, that was very well said. Uh, a couple of things that I, I want to kind of expound on here with you, which is the whole sound thing. Um, and it's not the first time that I have heard uh, statements about uh, the fact that we have a throat chakra and that we're actually able to make sounds. Apparently there are beings that do not have this same capability that the humans have. And I find that rather fascinating in, in, in and of itself. Um, and yet we, we don't utilize it in, in a positive way. And I'm going to give some examples for people of what you're actually speaking about. When, when a person is angry and they yell and they scream and they say foul things, um, you know, I, it, it actually can cause damage to another person. Um, it's not just what the words are. It's, it's, the, it's the literal 
uh, energy that comes from that individual. I've had people that have yelled at me, and it feels like somebody actually hitting me. I mean, it really does. It feels, it, it just feels horrible. So I would say to people is that, it, you know, there's a, there's a lot of responsibility with this sound. And if you really want to make the world a better place, if you want to make your own space a better space um, and place, then definitely pay attention to what comes from the voice itself and create the light as opposed to not. So let me tell you my dilemma. <laughs> um, I have been a part of, of many times of uh, groups of us where we've gotten together and either done mantras or toning or chanting or what have you. Here's what I have an issue with, or I particularly have an issue with, and I don't know if anybody's ever asked these questions before, but um, I have kind of a deep voice, and when I tone or I chant, it comes out even deeper, and I actually do not like the sound <laughs> of, of my own voice when I tone or chant. Well, oh, that's, okay, um... Let me um, answer that. And what the the beauty of working in a group is that everyone's voice kind of resonates at a particular note or a particular range. So when you are intoning or chanting, of course, there's there's voices that are much higher and there's voices that are lower. But when all those voices, and this is what's what's so powerful, when they're harmonizing, and that can either be an octave apart or, or even, you know, musically there's, there's different notes that harmonize with other notes within an octave. When, when everyone is really harmonizing, what is being created is a, a, a symphony of sounds or a, a, a whole kind of mysterious creation of something new. And th the power of this is that there are beings on the inner levels there are angelic beings, there's archangelic beings. So what, for them, when they, they hear, their perceptions, of course, quite different than for us, but they, they kind of pick up the energy that a, that a group is manifesting, and what they do is they expound upon it, or they, they add their quality to it so it becomes an even deeper, more glorious symphony. Essentially, what this is all about is that the, the, all of the universe is essentially the true part of the universe, not this Earth, not what's happening on the planet Earth, but, but on the inner realms and, and other planets that are, that are more evolved than us. What everyone is doing is they are singing gloriously to the divine, or the joy comes within and they are constantly in... in in sound making, creating beautiful adoration or just singing their happiness is probably the easiest way of saying it. So when a group comes together and able to do that here on the physical plane, there's an enormous response on the inner levels to, to magnify that and to glorify God. So... Okay, so I, I, I think I probably didn't explain completely and fully um, the, I, I, not liking the sound that comes out of my, my mouth when I chant or tone. Um, I actually feel like I'm the only one that's off key. It's like I can hear everybody else's toning or I can hear everybody else's chanting. It's, you know, it's like, it's like pulling in the whole complete vibration and I'm not able to get to the same, oh, that's not correct how I'm saying that. It's not like not being able to get to the same place. But I always feel like I'm, you know, just left of center of everyone. <laughs> I don't know how else to put it. It's like I can't, it's, it's like my chanting or toning, whatever it is that I'm doing, doesn't seem to fit into this big, beautiful, harmonious sound that I hear all around me when everyone is chanting or toning. Perhaps I could... Abs no, I, I know, because I, I work with some people who have the same feeling. They, okay. Yeah, they feel they're tone deaf or they don't like their 
their voice or they feel they can't sing. But the other side of this, and this is what I'm trying to explain, is that what's really the most important in all of this is your intent. Meaning that, and you have to kind of get, a, get aside your own personal feelings about however you sound, but if your intent is pure, what is happening on the inner levels is that these angelic and archangelic beings, they're picking up your intent. They're not hearing your sound. So okay. what that, so what that means is that they they are, they are feeling, feeling this devotion or feeling your longing to con to connect or this this feeling of of wanting something more. That that is what they pick up on, and they actually technically they're not they're not hearing the sound itself. They're in a completely different dimension. But what sure. they pick up on is that that energy that purity of intent. Okay. Um, well, I, I think I got some information there that, that will probably help me in, in future endeavors in group situations. Um, uh, part of it is I'm probably my own block because I really do not like the sound of my voice when I chant and, and it feels, I'm very self-conscious of it. It just, it feels invasive when I'm trying to chant. Or I used to make a joke and this is true that I could, when I sing, I make, small babies cry <laughs> so i don't well, know i have let, to get let over me, that let me say another thing this is also um this is part of the process that emery teaches is that you're you're essentially working with your throat chakra and your throat chakra is is a muscle is a is a very real energy field a force so like any athlete or, or anyone that's working on their body, they, they need to train their body to do whatever tasks they need to do. And it's the same thing with, with working with your throat chakra, with chanting or intoning, that what happens is that, and if you do it correctly, and that's part of the process too, is that the throat chakra actually begins to change and open and the sounds be change themselves because okay. you are working with those muscles in the throat chakra and they're beginning to open up. Okay, I understand. Okay, gotcha. It just clicked in. Okay, perfect. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the terminology because people have a misnomer about the term warrior, the way of the spiritual warrior. Can you please speak to the audience on that term of warrior? Yes, yeah, so everyone thinks that a warrior is someone who, who runs around and knocks people on the head or something. <laughs> <laughs> or someone's very aggressive, and what what Emery is saying, and, and I hope I can uh, portray the, the 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 quality of it well enough. What what he's saying is that anybody who is on the spiritual path, anybody who is trying to connect to the true self, anybody who who is on that quest for the Holy Grail, anybody who who really brings down light has to be a, a warrior. Meaning you have to you have to be per, you have to have perseverance you have to be tough in a way because the energy around us the worldly vibration is so intense and so and it's also getting more and more intense it's, it's, the world is speeding up there are and there's other books that Emery has written about and he talks about why the energy on this planet is speeding up why we're all getting so bombarded with, with so much stuff what he's saying is that to to really to be on that holy grail, you really have to be, in old terminology, you have to be a knight. You have to be very disciplined. You have to not give up on the path. You have to have a clear objective. And you have to, to, to work at it every single day. So you could say it's the, the timeless path to, to, to being a knight or the, the way of the spiritual knight. It's the same, same idea. But so the, that warrior is just a misconception that we have from too many, too many bad movies or, or <laughs> too, much, too much media going on about all the crazy things people are doing in the name of divine or the name of somebody or something. So those are all very bad misconceptions. So let's talk about the other books about the, you know, about what Emery talks about with the speeding up and things. I think this would be a good complement to this particular book, especially if somebody has not read or studied uh, a lot on this 
concept. I'm using that term very, very loosely here. Um, so can you can you tell us the titles or you know what where else those may be uh, obtained for the audience as well? Well, they're on soundinglight.com, and there's actually three books. Um, the first one was called Planetary Transformation, and the second book was the, let me see if I can remember the titles. It was the, um, it was about the Avatara, the Nine Ways to Enlightenment, and okay. the third one is the, um, the New Heaven and the New Earth. And what okay. these books do is that they give very specific reasons, it gives an overview of what's happening on the planet. And what he's saying is that there is a, uh, I'll try to say it as simply as possible, there's an influx of energy coming down, like an intensification of the light coming down from the inner levels down here to the physical plane. But there's also an uh, intensification of the horizontal energy, meaning that little planet Earth is, of course, in our solar system, our solar system is moving out of an area of the galaxy that was was softer, more pastoral. He gives the analogy of, of being on a train, you're in a train in Europe and you're, there's green pastures and it's very quiet and farmlands and all of a sudden that train is moving to, towards a big city towards a Paris or towards a Berlin. And as that train is moving from that pastures of, of the cows to, to city life, everything intensifies. So what he's saying is essentially that's happening to our little solar system. We are, we are moving out of that, that quiet cow pastures where we were before and we're moving towards the big dynamic energy of our galaxy, of a city itself. So that's part of the reason why everything's in, incredibly faster things, I mean, a day-to-day -day for a person on the planet in 2016 is very different than it was in 200 years ago or even 100 years ago. Things are speeding up, things speed up weekly, as Emery said, moment by moment, day by day, year by year, things are speeding up. So, but what also is happening, this is a, a, a part of a, the mystery and the beauty of what it means to be alive in 2016 is that the energy, the light itself, or the, the divine itself, has, has decided to step itself down, meaning that from these inner realms, the nirvanic, the, the buddhic planes, these beautiful realms from within, that light itself is coming down and is illuminating each dimension below it. So what is happening is that the, the light is coming all the way down, it's, it's, I understand is essentially on the astral plane and very likely for most of us in our lifetime we actually may see the light itself burst into the physical plane meaning we will actually witness phenomena in the sky or we'll experience nature waking up to light or we will experience um, qualities that, that most of us haven't experienced before because the light itself which is very intelligent, which is divine, is itself coming into our world. You know, um, you know, the reason, and I'm not trying to get you off topic here, the reason is is that sometimes uh, other people's um, earlier works or works that other people haven't been introduced to when they're uh, enjoying a topic such as this one can also give them um, motivation, or a, I call it the a compelling force to once they read about because um, that makes a lot of sense once they read about why the why they feel the way they do and why the world is being the way that it is and how they r interact with it or react to it depending on uh, the individual or the day or the moment um, I think it those are might be good prerequisites for people for their reading library <clears throat> in order to uh, get more involved with expansion, expansion of the self and the soul and our experiences and, and how we can actually assist that speeding train. Um, and, you know, it, and for anybody that doesn't recognize that, that it's a very different world out there, um, 
then they're probably not listening to this show. But if for somebody that wants some direction, um, I think the and I <clears throat> posted um, in the in our text box here uh, that the audience can't see uh, the link to your website, Sounding Light, um, and. I think Brian will post that in the chat room for people as well um, so that anybody that wants to go and look at, at the books and the information out there that they, that they have it. And I certainly will be posting that when I put it up in the archives as well so that people know where to go uh, besides Amazon, but going right to soundinglight.com. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about the book, um, uh, The Way of the Spiritual Warrior. This is, um, I have to tell you, when I, when I read the book, um, and it's unfortunate I had a whole bunch of books at the same time to read. I had a lot of authors that had contacted me, and um, I didn't give it um, as much attention as I wanted to, but I will tell you that this is one of those books that I will carry with me um, as I go about my days and, and weeks here um, because it's such a valuable book. It becomes um, kind of a reference guide, if you will, if you're, if you're feeling lost, if you're feeling like, you know, nothing's working for you, um, this book will really help to uh, put you back into the space of wherever it is if you kind of get veered off. Because our day-to-day -day life can do that. It can veer us off and we forget what we were doing because we're kind of relegated to our old routines. So um, I, I really, 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 really want to recommend this for people if nothing else, for uh, educational purposes so that um, those that have the more uh, cerebral minds can also understand there's a science behind this as well. Um, it's, it's fascinating. It's beyond fascinating. So as we're going through this, um, William, um, there's, a, there's so many things in here that we didn't get covered. And we, I don't know if we're going to have time to get them all covered. Um, but explain what... Um, like a person's personality, these are just things that has come up. Your personality, how it can affect the health. Also, uh, what is uh, something called the healing power of RAM? Um, let's let's talk a little bit about the whole healing aspect um, because there's a lot of people out there that are very interested in that topic, especially when we're uh, in this particular realm of healing and not traditional, what we call traditional Western medicine, which I myself don't think there's anything traditional about it. That's my opinion. Well, what, what Emery says, and, um, and this is also the, the analogy of the, um, the vehicle with the four tires, is that when you are balanced, when you are harmonized within, you, you, you don't have the conflict of disease. So when you are out of balance, or when you're stressed, or when you're driving around on a few of your tires, then then the disharmonies come into into your aura. And as what Emery says is that these these diseases or this disharmony actually does it's the last place it comes to is your physical body. What it does is that it actually enters into your aura and enters into your mental body or can move down into your emotional body. It can move down into your etheric body, and if you're not able to to dissolve it at those levels, then what it eventually does is it kind of worms its way down into your physical body. And of course, once it's in the physical body, then it, then it, the challenges to to become whole again or to become healthy are, are is greater. So what I'm really focused on is that by doing these practices, by being a spiritual warrior. What you're able to do is that you're able to, to keep your aura field vibrant and healthy and balanced, and in that way, you're, you're not suffering the, the, the diseases of, of being out of balance. So let's, let's and you know, that's, uh, first of all, um, I want to say that there is no separation between one part of us or another the mental, the emotional, the physical, the spiritual. Um, we have a tendency to not, as you stated very, very eloquently, to not use all those components. They don't always have all four tires, as Emory would say, on the ground or working at the same time. 
I think that should be the ultimate goal for any individual, especially if they really want to experience um, life to the fullest, right? Uh, because this is a very unique experience here on this planet, I, I believe. I believe it's a very unique experience. And uh, as human beings, we have some of the greatest potential ever, um, ever. And uh, I think we all owe it to ourselves individually as well as collectively to pull that in and to expand on that as much as we possibly can. Um, so as we're, as we're kind of talking here, as I'm listening to you, I, I keep coming back to this um, retreat that you took, uh, that you were three weeks uh, there doing that. Um, let's talk about the educational process then, because a retreat, not only is it a very special and certainly magical time. It's also an, an element of teaching or being in school. That's where you have the uh, help and assistance of uh, whoever the teacher is, in this case it's Emory, uh, to assist if you're not up with the program or if you're having challenges. Um, that's what it's there for, is to strengthen, to strengthen you. So, does Emory have any kind of other instructional um, places where people could go? Is there any other teachers besides him? Is there instructional videos? Is there anything for an introduction out there to people that they could begin with in order to better understand this man's deeply and profoundly and life-altering in a very positive way um, information? There's a there's a, to answer your question, there's another website, and the website is T-H-E, the, F-H-L, F as in Frank, H as in hello, L as light, dot org. So it's basically, it's the foundation for higher learning is the school itself. So if you want to know about, more about Emory, if you want to um, understand what he's doing, there's also um, contacts for people around the world if, if you are so interested. So it's the, the website that will give you a direction if you want to know more, the FHL.org. Perfect. Okay, I have looked that up. That is absolutely stunningly beautiful. That is beautiful, beautiful. And again, I'm adding this, and um, Brian will post that in the chat box. Um, before we run out of time here today, I'd like to... Uh, mention again to the audience that if you have any questions for William today, uh, please put those questions in all caps in the chat box and uh, Brian will forward those on to us. Um, we've given you a couple of websites today so that you can do further research. But I have to say in this, this kind of crazy mixed up world that um, seems to be apparent that this is um, can be the, I call it the saving grace for people, if they can really um, grasp and, and own this whole way of being. If you were to talk to somebody about this book, this particular book, William, and they just said, can you tell us about the book, and you wanted to share some of the more important or what you consider the most important or the most passionate things that you are about this book. Can you please do that now for us? Absolutely. And what what this what this book does is that it it opens up an incredible potential of who a human being is. And what it's also a part of, and this has been an Emory's teaching for the last 35 years is that what's happening on this planet is, is a very unique moment in the history of this planet. And if you really understand what's happening on the planet today, it will give you incredible hope and incredible joy, even though you may turn on the news or read a newspaper and it all looks very dark and, and horrible and completely messed up. The reason for that is that there is an energy, as I said before, there's this horizontal energy that, that's expanding. We're moving into a faster part of the, the galaxy or, or the solar system, or I should say the, the galaxy itself. 
But what is really also happening is that there's a stepping down of light. And what that means is that people are waking up because the light itself is stepping down. So this is an incredible time to be alive. Emery says you're very, very lucky to be alive at this point in time. But what this also means is that people who, who are not necessarily balanced within are also feeling this, this energy, are also feeling this pressure. So what they are doing is responding in the only way they know how. And they're responding in, unfortunately, very bizarre ways by driving trucks down crowded streets in Europe or blowing people up or doing all the crazy things they're doing. But what that means is that because this energy is stepping down, some people are waking up, many people are waking up, but also there's many people are not able to hold that energy and they're acting out in, in very, unfortunately, destructive ways. But what this means is that there's, there's, it, it's just, it's, it's a fact and this energy will increase. It's not going to diminish. So all these kind of things that we're witness, witnessing today in next year or the year after or even tomorrow will, will be more present. So it's good to know this is just part of where the planet is going and be prepared. And that's part of what a spiritual warrior is about, is that you, are, you understand what's happening to the earth. You understand what's happening to these energies, not just here on the on the physical plane itself, but you also understand what's happening on the energies within. You're understanding the, the pressure that the inner levels are pushing upon on our levels as a personality, and you're able to work with those, those new vibrations, those new energies, and able to help in, in your little, little creation of, of, of life, able to help whenever possible to to help someone who's struggling or help someone who who is, is not responding well to this new energy that you as a warrior, you as a, as a spiritual person are able to, to guide that person safely to, to the next step. So it's a, uh, it's a very beautiful time to, lot, to be alive. As Emery said, you're very lucky to be alive now. And it's good to be, to, for people to really embrace that instead of getting so bombarded by all the, the mass media or or even the internet, all the crazy things that are going on. Yes, it's definitely crazy, but what's also happening underneath that is this incredible burst of, of a new life, or a burst of a new human being. There's a new human being is getting born today, and that new human being will definitely change the destiny of the earth itself. Okay, so you just answered a couple questions, and I'm going to expound on that a little bit. So you would... You and Emery both would probably call this growing pains. It's like an evolutionary step. It's it's um, a mother goes through it in childbirth. Yes, it's 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 creating a, a a new human being. A new human being is is being created on the planet, and you know in in, in childbirth there is pain. So let's let's talk about the speeding train as it runs through this city. What happens on the other side? Well, we have a long way to get towards that city, so there's, we have centuries ahead of us of, of, of this accelerated energy. What, what the, the, the divine plan is, is that, and many, many spiritual traditions have talked about this for thousands of years, is that we enter the golden age, meaning that the earth itself can become a planet of light. At the moment, of course, it's a planet of darkness. It's a planet of war. But the, the train is basically headed towards the possibility that, that the human beings can usher in the golden age, can usher in an age where love and light and, and beauty will be the everyday instead of violence and, and aggression and war. You know that the, the golden age is, um, is a term that I, I heard, oh my gosh, uh, probably 20 years ago well, it was about the golden age and it went went through and I have spoken about this a hundred times on my show and I wish I could remember where I originally heard this um, and I actually watched it on a DVD it was uh, through um, oh James Earl Jones narrated this little film and it was really an astrological film. And when I, I'm not saying it was about astrology, but it was talking about the different ages. 
and what happens in these different ages and where it's, if you want to look at the clock, it's like at noon or midnight, whichever one you want to call that, is the golden age and how it's, um, our, our planet and our whole solar system has moved through, um, through time, I guess, and space and um, how we've come through these different ages and how humanity is going into the golden age. And I think that's, um, um, and, and I, for some reason that really stuck with me all those years ago. It just really, it, it just resonated with me, is that we're moving into this golden age. And I think it's, it, this is the, as you're saying, this is the, the birthing pains. I, I call them growing pains, birthing pains um, of humanity. And, and every uh, every one of us here have a choice. We have a choice to, decide whether we're going to be, you know, part of the, um, I guess, the uplifting of humanity. Uh, And we do that individually. And the more individuals that do this, the more collectively this planet becomes less chaotic and more at peace, more soothed, as you would say. Um, This is important work. Um, His work is very, very important. It's extremely important, especially in the now time. Um... And you are important because you're here uh, telling us about it and you're here sharing uh, your knowledge and your information, especially about Imre and his, his way of, of teaching. So as we're moving through, uh, people that are um, maybe on the more advanced path, and I don't mean to say that as a, some kind of a judgment that somebody's further or not as far along, it has nothing to do with that, but for those that maybe have already been um, somewhat enlightened or at least on some kind of a path or looking for more information, how would this book help them? This, this book will give them insight into who they are, insight into to how they're made up, insight to, to various different chakras, into to how those chakras are affecting you, how those chakras are related to each other. The... Um, of course, the, the most powerful quality that Emery talks about is that a spiritual warrior is really a, is, is someone whose heart, whose heart chakra is really open, meaning that, and this, Emery, long, long time ago, perhaps in the early 90s, he would, he would say that consciousness is the heart and the heart is consciousness. And I really had no idea what he was talking about. I was you know, coming from my intellect and my lower mind, and I couldn't understand how heart and consciousness somehow was in the same sentence. But when you, and this book will help you in that understanding, when, when you really journey within to the, to the holy grail within your heart, or the mysteries that are within your heart itself, what that means is that you are, um, you are becoming connected to, to other individuals, other quote-unquote spiritual warriors who are also connected within their heart. And what that means is that your consciousness is really vast. Your consciousness is, is not just kind of your little mental body swinging around your, your, your little aura, but you're, you're aware of a consciousness of an entire forest or a consciousness of an entire community. Or if you're really a true spiritual warrior, you're aware of, you're aware of the consciousness of the whole planet itself. So... But, and this is something I also wanted to, to speak before we leave that, that is so powerful about this golden age. What is the essential quality of the golden age is that there is the, the power of the group itself. And just on this last retreat in Emory, with Emory in Germany, Emory was talking about group unity or group consciousness. And he gave this beautiful metaphor. We had retreats up in Canada, up, up in the wilderness in Canada, and there would be a wolf that would howl. And as Emery said, the, you know, like this alone, single kind of average wolf howls. And then down the road, you would hear another wolf howling. And then down the road, you would hear another wolf howling. And then eventually, all these wolves are howling simultaneously. And what he says is that when these wolves are howling simultaneously, they become incredibly powerful. And they become powerful first of all, through that sound, but they also become powerful because it's the energy of the group itself. So part of this moving towards this golden age is that more and more people are 
will realize that, of course, you do your individual work and your meditations and, and all of that. That's part of it. But what the real power is that when you come together in a group and you do spiritual work, you, you, your intent in a group is, is that to, to unite or, or search out that holy grail or be con connected to the divine or, or be united as one. That is that kind of power of the group is what this fast train is, is moving towards. That golden age is the power of the group itself. So let me, let me share with you a little story uh, um, that I found really fascinating. Many, many years ago, there was a little video out that I watched. Somebody shared it with me, and that was in the days before the Internet became so popular, but it, there was, uh, it was still, the Internet was still available. And somebody had sent me a video, and it was a gentleman who was, um, he was actually a, a, a scientist as well as a, a very spiritual individual. Um, and he was doing an experiment on water, trying to prove that water had certain qualities to it. And um, that we could affect, the human being could affect the quality of water and change water so that they did these experiments and they took these two glasses and one glass of water. Uh, they sang beautifully to it and played beautiful music and, you know, talked lovingly to this water and this other glass of water. They yelled at us and they screamed at it and, you know, played terrible music. And um, they did a, a, a science um, comparison um, and they showed the composition. Now, this water came from the same source. Um, there was this was very well documented. It was done very scientifically and was very well documented. And of course, the water that was saying to lovely and and um, you know talked to nicely had this uh, had a beautiful clarity to it. It was a, a fresh, clean water. It was it was lovely. This other water was literally contaminated. So after many of these different types of experiments, he decided he took a group of people out to this very polluted small little polluted lake, very polluted, one of the most polluted there was, and took them out and they all sat in meditation uh, next to each other around this lake. Um, and after, uh, after a few hours, they, they took a sample of the water and it had already improved. And I think after almost a, a complete day, it was like eight hours, I believe, and I, it's been a long time since I watched this video, that this water was actually totally cleared up um, and that it was now no longer a toxic, literally a toxic waste kind of a place that it was actually uh, available for wildlife to drink in or, or children or adults or whatever to, you know, take a swim in, whatever. It was no longer contaminated. Uh, the point here wasn't about um, the water itself. The point here was about the experiment in when the minds are in unison, when the soul and the heart are in unison, um, what we can accomplish as human beings um, in an extremely positive, powerful way. And all it took was a little time for people to sit and focus on that. What an amazing place this would be, wouldn't it? The, the power of the group is enormous. It is. And, and we're, we're, just, we're just beginning, and that's part of this new Aquarian age. Aquarius is very much group-oriented. And when more and more people wake up and realize the incredible potential that we have, when we come together as a group with a common intent, there'll be no stopping us. There'll be, there'll be, we can accomplish miracles because the, the group itself is a thousand times, a hundred thousand times more powerful than a single individual. So you can imagine if one morning most of humanity woke up and, and meditated, this world would be transformed in a second. Yeah. I mean, you know, the the uh, the whole idea here is, is, wow, what, you know, the potential here is just, you know, unlimited. We, as human beings, we've just not even tapped into it. But I have to say that the energies are supporting those that are, um, that's what this is about. You know, this is the time that we're in. I think Emery said it very well, what, this is just a dynamic time for us all to, to be in. Um, because in some sense, I guess, we can be the pioneers. Um, I don't know if, if, do you guys ever work with children? 
uh, because I've noticed a huge surge in young children, young kids, uh, young teenagers who are extremely aware and are trying to work with others in bringing out a better world. Um, they're just extremely conscious, way more than I think that I was, or maybe even you when we were younger. Uh, you know, I you know I certainly don't want to put you in the same category, but uh, way more um, conscious of their potential than what we were. The absolutely, and the young people, children, and and teenagers. I was on the retreat in Germany. There were many, many children there, um, teenagers, college students in the twenties, and I was just in awe of how how focused and how clear and how disciplined. Um, these these students were, and and really working very intently to to be to become part of this group consciousness. Really working intently to 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 bring this. Um, there was an experience we had at the end of the second week, and we were doing um, various different um, intoning of vowels. And one university student, um, four hours later, was still walking around in disbelief, and we started talking about it and you know i said to him well the the heavens opened up and the light poured down and he 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 was so overjoyed because what he experienced he said he felt like he was in a sauna and someone just poured a huge bucket of water over his head but it was like light it's just like this this light just poured into his being so what what's and that's the power of the group that's that, that incredible power when 150 people, any group, comes together and able to, to, to really connect to the inner levels. The inner levels respond themselves. They're incredibly intelligent. They are these phenomenal beings. And they love us. And they are wanting us to, to become united with them. They want, us, they want us to help this planet become a planet of light. So they respond and they, they, they literally pour light into us so it was a it was an amazing experience to witness and and to um to be a part of what a beautiful that's beautiful absolutely beautiful okay well <clears throat> pardon me before i let you go here today um do you have anything else that you would like to share with the audience um this day before we we wrap this up and you give the rest of your links and stuff like that the one thing I do want to say is that I know the world is looking very crazy, but what, what, what we really need is also compassion. And what I mean by that is that, yes, the energies are intensifying, and yes, some people are waking up, but, but those people who are, for whatever reason, unable to, to wake up, for whatever reason, are responding in anger or violence or, or all these crazy ways, it's, it's essentially they, they can't do anything else but what they are doing meaning that what they really need is that if you understand it, you understand that, that since we're kind of in a, in a pressure cooker, that it's just part of the process and it's just, it's a fact. And the only thing you can really do is just be compassionate. And if you're able to help someone who isn't in that crisis, gently help them and perhaps some way down the road that, we won't be witnessing so many crazy things that are happening. Wouldn't that be a lovely thought? I th you know, that's uh, something that I hang on to. I, I really do, uh, William. I hang on to that. Um, certainly, I wish for uh, to leave when it's my turn. It's not my time yet, but when it's my time to leave this planet, then I've left it in a better, somewhat better place than what I found it. So... Um, if you will again give the websites out, um, I know that Brian did post them, but if you will go ahead and where the book can be, Brooks book, this particular one, The Way of the Spiritual Warrior, as well as all the rest of them, uh, can be purchased and found and more information. If you would give that out before we let you go here today. Absolutely. The books can be found at soundinglight.com. It's one word, sound, in, I-N-G, light, soundinglight.com. And if you want to know about the group or Emory or um, classes somewhere in the world, the website is the, F as in Frank, H, hello, light, dot org, the FHL dot org. 
And I highly recommend everybody that's listening to this now as well as those that will be listening to this in the future and um, that you go and check out those websites um, for those who uh, really want to maybe um, at least put your foot in and, and learn a little bit more about this. Um, it's the, the information, the support, the it's just phenomenal. Um, highly recommended for anyone that... Um, is is interested in such things, and we hope that all of those that are listening are. This is just fabulous. William, you have just been an absolutely fantastic uh, guest to have here today. Um, when you do see or speak with Emery again, uh, tell him how um, wonderful we think his work is. I know I personally do, and for his contribution to humanity is beyond words. Um, it's it's beyond anything except for thank you. I mean, I say that in all sincerity. Uh, I appreciate it, and I appreciate your time today. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. Oh, and thank you so much. It's been it's been fabulous. And for all of you out there, until we meet again, where will your life's journey lead you? Many blessings and good day. <laughs>